Uh, welcome back to those of you who have been in the morning sessions and welcome back to those who have been dipping in and out. Uh, and also welcome to those who are just joining us for the afternoon session. It's lovely to be here and to see so many of you. And I can see the number of people um, is increasing. So I suspect that people will continue to join us uh, as we continue in the in the afternoon session. So uh, let me begin by introducing myself to those of you who don't know me. My name is Rasha DeMarco. Um, I'm Associate Director of Research and Development at Cambridge and Peterborough Foundation Trust, a mental health and community NHS service provider and also host for the ARC East of England. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Um, and I've got to say we've had some fantastic um, talks in this morning's session on themes uh, revolving around living well in the east of England, working with young people in the region and getting research into everyday practice. Don't worry if you've missed the morning sessions because the sessions were all recorded, as uh, will the this afternoon session be recorded as well. Also, if, you, if you've missed um, Wendy's introduction this morning, uh, the showcase has had to be accommodated uh, virtually due to the number of people who have registered uh, for the event, which is really fantastic. It's lovely to see so much engagement and interest. And uh, once again, it's lovely to see you all um, here. So uh, let's make use of the technology available to us in these virtual settings and make the uh, coming talks and sessions interactive and as engaging as possible. Uh, in fact, if you want, you could type in the chat, present here, excited, say hello, do an emoji. Uh, whatever it is, or even like if you if you haven't had the chance to to leave your desk uh, up until now, just stand up, uh, shake a little bit. Uh, let's set the tone for a positive, engaging energy, uh, because I promise you uh, to um, that you'll have some uh, fantastic speakers and talks coming up. Um, so welcoming everybody's comments. Let's stay engaged. You will have the opportunity to put all your questions uh, in the chat uh, throughout the sessions. There will be three sessions. Uh, the chair of each session will keep an eye, um, along with other uh, colleagues, on your questions coming into the chat. And at the end of each session, there will be a, um, a panel discussion uh, time where your uh, questions will be presented to the panel and you'll have your questions answered. Uh, so keep them coming and stay engaged. Um, so just uh, run through the, the sessions that we're expecting uh, to, to have presented to us today. Uh, we'll have the first se session being kicked off on engaging with communities. Uh, that will be including research on engaging with travelers uh, and, Roma, and Roma communities, the impact of cultural interventions and how the ARC East of England works with our communities across the region. Uh, the speakers we will expect to hear from are Elspeth Mathie, Ewan Speed, Claire Thompson, and Bryony Porter. All of them are experts in the field of community engagement and inclusive involvement. This will be followed by the second session on increasing skills for undertaking research in the region. Uh, and the real treat here is that we'll be um, listening to two individuals who have gone through the ARC Fellowship. So the focus of this session, the second session, uh, will be on the ARC uh, Fellowship Programme. We're going to have Deborah Shepard speaking about her experience on the programme. And we'll also have Alison Bentley speaking to us. Um, Alison is now a researcher and she'll be speaking to us about how the programme has helped to shape her career. The third and final session will be in, is entitled The Journey of Our Research, and it'll include talks by Claire Goodman and Chiara Lombardo on projects that started at the Clark and have continued with the ARC. Um, as a dem and this will be a demonstration of how research evolves um, and how the ARC has shaped this. This will then be followed by uh, final and closing remarks from Wendy. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome Elspeth to kickstart the first session for us. Uh, enjoy the sessions, uh, stay engaged. Elspeth, the floor is all yours, take it away. Thank you, Rasha. I don't know if everybody can see me and hear me, but I, ho I hope you can, or if you can't, I'm sure I'll be appearing in a minute. 
Um, so thank you for that lovely introduction. And yes, we have got an exciting afternoon for you today. So our session is about engaging with communities. And my name is Elspeth Mathy, and I'm based at the University of Hertfordshire in the Centre for Research in Public Health and Community Care, CRIPAC. And I co-lead the inclusive involvement in research theme with Fiona Poland, who is at the University of East Anglia and she will be chairing the panel at the end. So I'm just doing the introduction. So we're doing a top and tail for this. Our theme researches different approaches to include members of the public. And we've heard from quite a few this morning about carers, young people and learning disabilities. And in this theme, we're really trying to include the communities or whatever that terminology means, and we can discuss what those communities are to include those who are often not heard in research. So as Rash has said, we've got some excellent speakers this afternoon, and we've not only got researchers from our universities and from the ARC, but we also got some of our community partners as well. So Professor Ewan Speed and Sally Burrows from the um, University of Essex will be speaking with Sherry Smith, Director of Gates Essex, Gypsy and Traveller Essex. Joining Claire Thompson for the second session, um, evaluating cultural interventions. She will be um, joined by Sadia Begum, the uh, for researcher, both at the University of Hertfordshire, and Bryony Porter will be telling you about our um, the PSIP group, which stands for Public Community Involvement, Engagement and Participation. And she will be joined by Debbie Drew, who is one of our public contributors as well. So I look forward to hearing their sessions. And as Rasha said, please put as many questions in the chat as you'd like so that we can have a really good discussion at the end. So I'd like to invite our first speakers. So Ewan, Sally and Sherry, I'm not quite sure in which order you're taking that, but if you'd like to come on and start your presentation. Hello. Um, we all agree that research subjects should be should also be active research participants and given real opportunities to shape research. So working with the ARC has given me the opportunity to speak with people and organisations in Thurrock in Essex to find out their research priorities. And that's how our research project began with Sherry and Ewan and, and, and many others. Um, I wanted to hear from people who are not usually heard, people that can be hard to hear and under and that are underrepresented in research and marginalised and underserved in life. Various people working in health and care in Thurrock said that local travelling populations and Roma communities were presenting late with serious health problems and they felt that attention should be given to the inequalities of Gypsy Roma traveller health and the barriers of access to health care. I knew already that these groups experienced huge inequalities in many aspects of life, including health, <clears throat> but I can't move the slides. Can someone move the slides forward. And again. Thank you. But for us to go forward, it was imperative to find out that the, if this was an issue that gypsies and trap, it was imperative to find out if this was an issue that people wanted us to work with, work on with us. Um, so I made contact with the Travellers Movement to see what they thought about us putting together a research proposal and they told me to get in touch with Sherry, who will speak in a minute. I found a local Roma charity on the internet and spoke with, with them and they suggested another group um, for us to work with locally and we started working together to co-produce a research proposal. We talk with community representatives, including Sherry, about how to consult, consult with gypsies, Roma and travellers on our ideas. And through these local organisations, we were able to consult with 83 gypsies, Roma and travellers in the east of England um, to put together our research proposal. Along the way, we also linked in with Shirley Barrett at One Voice for Travellers. And we kept talking with our community partners whilst we put together a research proposal and they became co-applicants on the research project that's now been funded by the National Institute for Health Research. We've just completed stage one of building a community of practice for Gypsy Roma Traveller access to health care. And community members have interviewed about 40 more Gypsies, Roma and Travellers as part of that. So now I'm going to pass over to Sherry to tell us something about the issues of cultural competencies required from people, to, from, from everyone really, to understand and communicate better with one another, researchers, health workers, and gypsies, Roma travellers themselves. 
and also about why inclusive research matters. Over to you, Sherry. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear and see me clearly. It's been quite a while since I've done a Zoom, so you'll have to forgive me. So about cultural competency, um, right from the outset when Sally spoke to me, <clears throat> she was like, we need our research to be different. What makes it different? And I said, well, if you're appealing to my community, you need to make them feel safe, make them feel part of it. And I think that was reiterated by every organisation that we went to, everyone we worked with, but different organisations that are not community led did it in different ways. So it's very easy to upset people and their barriers go up again just by forgetting to capitalise the first letter of travellers or by referring or by women asking personal questions about men and vice versa. Maybe because we're so used to being ostracised and have been discriminated against our whole lives, but maybe it's because we're used to just not being understood even after being here 500 years. You need to have a real genuine understanding as a community organisation, but also as a community member just to try and gain trust and connection so as not to put the barriers and their hackles up. There's an assumption that gypsies and travellers have the mainstream that ha have the mainstream cultural competency, but we don't always. People take for granted the social cultural competency that you get through going to school and engaging with wider society. Having your first job, being employed by someone, going abroad, they forget that competency that you get that enables you to live an easier life. We know the lives lived now by apps, digital access, and generally different language that many of us are used to. When you're living in a bubble and you work, socialize, and live within layers and generations of your own family with similar lives, then how do you negotiate this big real world with its long words and its apps and its digital access? It's like learning a whole new language. There are a lot of people who don't know how to use Google or how to go home and research what's wrong with them or book appointments online for services or even what a CV is, let alone how to write in their often their wealth of experience and knowledge in the world without the usual format of school GCSEs and A-levels and the formula that, you know, the rest of the world is used to. It doesn't mean we're stupid. It just means we're different. There's a different language we need to understand or how to read a bus tra train or tube timetable or even how does oyster work? Things we take for granted, we learn as teenagers at school, out with other friends from different lives, worlds, countries. This is not the same for us as gypsies and travellers, whether we're housed in bricks and mortar or whether we're on social housing site. So for example, 95% of us are in bricks and mortar accommodation, but we all suffer the same health outcomes, whether in bricks and mortar or in mobile accommodation or even living by the side of the road, which is thought to be less than a thousand families now. So this is what life is like for many gypsies and travellers. We've existed, lived and communicated and socialised within bubbles of our relatives and they're just trying to live now in this new world with all these new rules. That's why our mental health rates are so bad, so high. Suicide, depression, postnatal health, prenatal health, all of it is hard for us. When they say we're hard to reach, they're trying to use a language and a way of working that doesn't fit this community. Maybe the reach is too hard. For example, I was watching the other week about farmers, you know, that Jeremy Clarkson show, and everyone keeps laughing at the country people that are around him and they've never left their village and they couldn't understand them because they're like us. They talk to their own people. They say you talk with a twang. They say they're aggressive. They say they're confrontational because they talk with their arms. But actually, that is just a language that is normal to them and a way that they express themselves normally. The ones that have never come off of the farms didn't learn to talk any differently, and that's basically travellers. If you've only ever met with your kin, you have your own way of talking together. In another way, it's a little bit like Liverpool. Um, I just put this in this morning, but it's a li little bit like Liverpool. Liverpool has a very distinct language, even though it's in the north. Very distinct tone, and the reason for that is because of its naval connections and how many Irish have descended and moved and into Liverpool. And because of their own way of speaking, their own words that are in there, their own tone and twang. I mean, and I think that that's exactly what's happened happens with gypsies and Roma and traveler, and it's often misunderstood. I had many different influences. I was lucky enough to go and school until I was 15. Um, my mum's Irish, my dad's Romani. So I feel like I'm able to tread in both camps um, my nan was 
was subject to forced assimilation in the 1960s. She was one of those that was forced to come off the road into a house. And now three generations later, my children speak our language and still generate and present themselves as we do. But this is forced assimilation. This is something that we're fiercely protective of. So this is where it brings me back to research to say that if you're looking to engage with this community, recognising um, how important their ethnicity, their community, their language and their old fashioned ways is to them is important to get the right research. But Gypsy and Traveller Voices are important in the research we're doing and I want to help people need to listen and understand to what they're saying. So I think it's inclusive research leads to better research and greater impact. Is this me still now, Sally or Ewan? Yeah, keep going, Sherry. Okay, so inclusive research leads to better research and greater impact. So it requires the involvement of academics and I've done a BA, so I'm well aware of what an academic is. I've worked for a university and, but it also requires um, a range of community members. You need different stakeholders on the project team and good representation of those who are the focus of the study. So you do need people in the middle, gate, gate, a gate holder or a gatekeeper isn't the right expression, but we're a bridge. We're a bridge into you getting what you need. There's massive assumptions about gypsies and travellers that are wrong. We don't all live on the road, as I said to you, or on sites. We're not all illiterate. We talked about so much in the media and by academics that we need to make sure that the voices are out there of community on the ground, how we're experiencing this, because generations of us have been researched and researched and answered these questions, and still we've got the worst life outcomes, the worst education or the worst health outcomes. So um, there has to be a reason to get this community and many ethnic minorities to engage with you. Um, so doing the research interviews ourselves got us even more in touch with our communities and their needs. I wanted to get myself back on the ground and do these interviews myself. I mean, I run two charities, a national and one in Essex, but I wanted to do these. On the sites over COVID and since there was a definite lack of engagement and face-to-face -face still from the Gypsy Roma Traveller community, I wouldn't say we're ostracised, but they're less hesitant to come and sit at big community dinners with us and things like that. When I did the interviews for our research, I made the time to go and have breakfast with these people on my own and to talk to them individually about their whole self, how they feel, how their life is. And I think that opened them up. I think that opened me up to becoming more able to obtain the correct research that was required. If I'd have just done them on the phone or if I'd have done them by, hi, I'm here and I'm Sherry, I think that... Um, to take the interview and then going home, it would not have been the same. We would not have had the same sense of um, the research quality, but also the trust that came from us as interviewers between us and the interviewees was, was there and it was stable because we'd been there since the stages when this was formulated. Um, so I think I keep coming away from the words that are written down. I think that because the research was well rewarded for the organisations, so my organisation was unfunded. We were given enough money for this for me to be able to dedicate my own personal knowledge, experience and time to this, but also rewarding financially the interviewees, because as I said, they've been interviewed up to the eyeballs and their lives haven't changed. So that was important for us to get the good quality data, different data. Things come out of this that we really didn't think and I hadn't even considered. And I've been doing work around health for seven or eight years. For us to do peer-to-peer -peer interviews was really important so we could get the real issues, we could understand each other. So when you're going to people and asking them about their access to healthcare, you've got to know how to approach them, how to get them chatting, what their trust is, what issues they've encountered. And it's a lot easier if you've encountered them yourself. To us, our elderly are sacred. And it helped a lot always asking about their families and their parents and opening up conversation being able to dig underneath and discover really what they felt was needed from the health system and what was missing. We have got the hardest life. If you live on a site, <clears throat> going in and out to the toilet and doing your washing outside and the cost of the electric is much more expensive, even despite the cost of living, it's more expensive. It's suffering intolerable everyday racism. 
you know, even from statutory services, people treating you differently than they do the rest of the world, it is still very much an acceptable racism. There's police raids, there's a lack of statutory services, even Meals on Wheels, mental health suicide, the compacted grief through the closeness of tears and generations of your families that you live with. The last thing you really care about is how rude somebody was to you last time you went to day and e or whether somebody from a local charity phoned you up to see how you're dealing with bereavement. So I know that sounds like we're, I'm, I'm dismissing it. What I'm saying is my community need this. They just don't know how much they need this because we're not communicating to them in the right way. The last, so unless you've connected, so I'll, I'll just read this bit. Someone who was rude to somebody I spoke to this morning when they picked their bins up. And so the postman was rude to him and someone's rude to him at school yesterday. And so that rudeness comes out against us as gypsies and travellers. Unfortunately, it does. Um, it isn't really figuring with, us, with them. So with this research, we've been able to help create the questions and ask the questions and help people taking part to find their answers. So, for example, we were able to avoid questions about STDs, STIs, um, prostate cancer, breast cancer, you know, there wouldn't be a woman asking a man those questions or a man asking a woman those questions. So we were able to have this cultural competency and knowledge as academics, what was needed to make it impartial whilst getting the right research back. And I think it was important how involved we were. So by saying what matters and helping design the research, how we did it, speaking with our people ourselves, we learned more about what we want to do to help people access healthcare. And myself and I know two of the organisations we work with have already set up focus Hi, groups. Sherry, and... sorry, just conscious of time. Yeah, I've got two more paragraphs. It'll just be two seconds. Um, involvement in Gypsy and Traveller is not always easy. We don't often answer phones. We don't turn up to meetings. We know we like herding cats. So try different things. Try WhatsApp, try voicemail, try a contact in a local community, a dedicated member of staff, knowledge, invest in training from an organisation that is locally based and is a, a member-led organisation. So like Gate Essex, Compass, One Voice, Gate Hearts. Um, and a lot of this has been learned because of COVID, because we sit, didn't sit in a room with anyone, but from this, we were able to decompress with this research and learn from each other. Sorry, you and I'll let you take over now. I didn't leave you long, but... That's all good, Sherry. Thank you. I mean, I think this is just all points to the idea of an ethics of participation, which is something we're trying to develop in the um, in the project. Um, but I'm conscious of time, so I, well, I had a bit to say about that, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Can you hear me there, Ewan? Thank you so much, Sherry, um, Ewan and Sally there. I'm really sorry, I've got so much to say and I do hate on these times having to rush people onto the next one, but we'll just go on to Claire and hopefully there'll be some time for um, for questions in the in the panel. So now I'm gonna move on to Claire Thompson and uh, Sadia who are going to tell us about evaluating cultural interventions. So Claire and Sadia, if you'd like to, to come onto the screen now, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, so yeah, um, hello everyone. We're going to tell you um, a little bit about a project um, we've been doing for the last couple of years, um, working with Muslim communities um, to do an evaluation of a bowel cancer screening um, intervention. And we've been doing like an evaluation or a feasibility study of that. And we've um, learned quite a bit from that, I think, trial and error. Um, is it okay to have the next slide, please? So the intervention itself that we've been looking at is this kind of one hour educational session. So it's been adapted from um, like a cancer research talk that's given, but it's been adapted um, from the Muslim community and then it's delivered by a Muslim clinician in a mosque or community setting with the relevant languages and then talks about kind of the relevant um, foods and, and the relevant cultural points to make it kind of acceptable to that audience. And it was it was done that way by the British Islamic Medical Association, who fortunately we've been able to partner with for this. So they're delivering uh, this intervention in, in Luton and in Peterborough. And our research team has been evaluating it and seeing how it went. 
So we've recruited participants across Luton and Peterborough, and then we give them a survey to ask um, about their attitudes to bowel cancer screening just before they go to the educational session, just after, and then we follow them up six or 12 months later, and we're looking to see if it's had an impact on their knowledge, their awareness, their attitudes, and their behaviour around cancer screening. We also did some interviews and, and focus groups with people who'd been to the session to see to see what they thought of it and the people who delivered it. Uh, can I have that? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, the reasons that we're doing this research will probably be familiar to most of you anyway. Um, we know that bowel cancer screening uptake is lower in some communities, especially South um, Asian ones. And there's been some theories put forward for why this is in some research, but we still don't know enough about it. And as you'll see from some of the things listed on the slides, a lot of them reasons given can be a bit blamey, if you know what I mean. It can problematise the group rather than the message or how things are going across. Um, and if you're not familiar with BEMA, um, that's uh, kind of, they operate as an, a charity and an association of Muslim clinicians and healthcare professionals, and they're, they're volunteer led. And this approach they've taken that we've been researching with the intervention, we're kind of calling it a faith placed intervention. So going out to people in their communities rather than expecting them to come to the healthcare professionals. And I'm uh, going to hand over to Sadia now, who's um, senior research assistant on the project, who's been involved in um, all the data collection, either on the phone or in mosques, and tell you a lot about what's gone right and wrong and what we do differently and, and might be helpful to know when, whenever you're ready, Sadia. Thank you. OK, so I'll be covering the awareness of research in different cultures, the challenges in data collection and some ways to work around the challenges. Next slide. Okay, so a crucial point to remember when working with diverse communities is that they may not all be aware of what research is, or they may be aware, but they have different levels of awareness um, of you know what it is, what it entails, and why it's important. Um, some may not know anything about you know research methods, so if they're confronted with a survey for the first time, they may be confused, or they even may be frustrated that you know someone's trying to ask them a set of questions. Now, this isn't to criticize them or say there's something wrong with them, but it's more about what the research community do or what they don't do, you know, in communicating why research is important and why it's needed. Um, there is a lack of easily accessible information that's related to various aspects of public health for ethnic minorities, and there definitely needs to be more coming from community sources, um, trusted community sources, and there needs to be space for them to ask um, a lot of questions. Okay. So before mentioning the challenges in data collection, a highlight of our study, um, I would like to mention a highlight of our study, which was that um, we did a, a one day event, a follow up session in a mosque in Peterborough, and a participant actually approached me and he had told me that um, he attended the intervention session prior, I think a year before that, where he found out about um, what bowel cancer was and screening and why it's important. And he said that after the session, he actually went home and he prompted his wife to take a screening kit, where unfortunately, they did find out that she had cancer but because they caught it on um, early stages they were able to treat it and she's now recovering and one thing he said to me was that if he didn't attend the session then he wouldn't have realized how important it is and he wouldn't have prompted his wife so he was saying that you know that initially saved his wife's life and I think you know we were all really pleased to hear about that because it showed us that our research had meaning and applic applicability now, going on to the challenges, well, the first challenge was that because of COVID-19, there was a huge disruption in the study and we had to sort of pick things up from where we last left it. Um, so when collecting the data on the day, um, we had a register of people that were attending. And um, even though people said that they'd attend, we were still waiting around for a long time. So we had to chase them up and call them, which did delay our start time. So that was quite challenging on the day. Another challenging thing was the language barrier. So um, if for our focus group, um, the peer facilitator was talking, was going through the topic guide in English, but she had to pause to translate in Urdu. And then the second peer facilitator had to translate in Punjabi. So the focus group actually lasted a lot longer than what was expected. And 
um, our participant actually had to leave um, just about after halfway through the session because he had somewhere to be. And a lot of the pa uh, participants kept asking when it's going to finish. So I think that's something to keep in mind when doing studies, you know, with people that come from, um, that have different languages. Um, have I missed out any other challenges, Claire? I'm sure there's loads more, but all the ones you was going to talk about, yes. Okay, okay. So um, as researchers, this is a bridge that we have to cross. Uh, we need to find ways to be able to work around the challenges that may come with this. It's our duty to communicate, you know, why research is important and why it's needed. And we need to be able to give um, people from these communities a chance to find out about it. Uh, one way this can be done is professionals aiming to improve outreach. So if professionals go to community settings such as, you know, community centres, mosques or churches in order to inform ethnic minorities of public health concerns, um, another thing that can be done is getting more doctors um, involved from the same ethnic background in order for participants to be able to relate to them more as they'll be able to align health promotion with their own values. Um, have I missed out anything? I think maybe the importance of GPs I was going to say the... You can clarify on that. Yeah, so one thing that, um, that come up when we was doing the recruitment and the data collection was really the importance of having GPs um, from the same community because mm -hmm. of the standing they have um, in various communities and they're real key kind of gatekeeper people who can, who can help you or a trusted source. And even though they're really busy, if you can get a few on side, um, yeah, that was that was magic for us. That and the um, all the transcription as well, um, time and resources for specialized transcription because you can't just send send that off if it's in three different languages that's something we've had to sort out quite carefully oh thanks very much um sadia and we just wanted to finish off by saying thank you to all the partners and the people who've supported the research some of whom are listed there um but there are more um and of course um thanks to sadia for making a lot of the data collection um, possible on the day and beforehand. Thanks very much for listening to us. Thank you so much, Claire and Sadia. That was really interesting. And then there's parallels, of course, with Sadia's and Ewan's pro um, project before talking about the bridge of languages. So now we're going on to our final session in this uh, final talk in this session, um, reflecting on how we work with communities, Bryony Porter and Debbie Drew. So I'll hand over to you two now and uh, then we should have some time for questions in the panel afterwards. Thank you so much, Elspeth. And hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. And I'm really pleased to be joining you here today with Debbie Drew, who is a public contributor who works uh, particularly with Claire's theme, with the prevention research theme. And my name is Bryony Porter, and I'm the public community involvement, engagement and participation lead for the Applied Research Collaboration. Today, Debbie and I are here to reflect a little bit with you about how we've been working with communities and to start with, I'm going to share with you a little bit about one of the approaches that we've been taking, um, including the findings of a review of this approach. And then we're going to hear from Debbie about her reflections of how we work with communities and a little bit more reflecting at the end about how we can improve some of the work that we do. So one of the approaches to working with communities that we've taken has been to focus some of our work and some of our projects in working with specific areas across this incredibly huge region that we all live and work in. And we've been doing this by working with communities in the east of England that vary in terms of their location, uh, in terms of socioeconomic factors, health inequalities and demographics of the populations in those areas. But also these areas have in the past been very underserved by research as well. So since the start of the arc, we've been working in uh, so-called by us, these populations in focus areas of Peterborough and Fenland, Great Yarmouth and Waveney, Stevenage and Thurrock. Earlier this year, we started to spend a bit of time reflecting on how this approach had been going since the start of the arc. And to do this, um, I interviewed researchers from across our research themes, as well as people who've been living and working within these communities that we've been working with from each of these areas. From our review, we have found that uh, engagement from our research themes and with our researchers in these areas does vary across the research themes. 
for some of them, um, there have been pre-established relationships with these areas and also some of our university partners that we work with are geographically closer to some of these areas than others that's made it you know, somewhat easier to develop links with those particular areas. But overall, we do believe that working for some of our projects in particular, specifically within these areas, has supported a deeper understanding of what's going on in terms of health and social care infrastructure and within communities as well. And this is both from the researcher perspectives, but also in terms of what we've all learned as a collective working with our community partners too. Some of our researchers, though, talked about how this approach had helped them to really focus their work. But all of the researchers that we talked to did also mention how they were conscious of how through, you know, through defining areas of being in need or deprived that this approach could have been seen as kind of problematizing people, which was an uncomfortable and an unintended consequence. But over time and as those projects developed and those good quality relationships developed, um, the genuine nature of the work was seen. We did also hear from the community partners that we interviewed that they'd regarded the local focus of the work that had been offered as something that was really valuable and helping to understand what's going on within these communities um, and helping them and us to be informed about what the priorities are for improvements in health and social care that would be meaningful to the community themselves. Both of the both the researchers that we talked to and the community partners that we interviewed as well reflected on the wide breadth and depth of uh, learning that they'd gained from career and personal professional development opportunities that had taken place through these projects and these relationships that had developed. This included learning new and sort of alternative methods around creative and different approaches to community engagement, um, new experience of doing public engagement opportunities. But importantly for many from both sides, from both the researchers and our community partners, was this wider network of relationships and opportunities for future collaborations that had developed. Now, hopefully, if Debbie's able to come onto video and um, onto mic, I'd love to hand over to you, Debbie. And it'd be great to hear from you about what interests you with being involved with the ARC and what are your reflections about how we work with communities? Thank you. Well, I got involved with the ARC just by chance, really, I was working doing some work in Claire, who's on the call here, uh, Thompson, collared me. She was doing some work around food inequalities during COVID. So I've only been involved fairly recently. I knew nothing about the art, absolutely nothing. And certainly nothing about, I always knew research happened, but never knew that people, real people got involved. I'm not calling you guys not real, but um, people on the ground. Um, so having not been to university myself, but actually I've always been interested in health. So my interest in, in joining in was really around by health inequalities has always been an interest in mine, having been a teenage mum, a single parent with a disabled child and still caring now, sort of 42 years of caring, sort of from the age of 18, still caring. So one of the brackets of we call inequalities, um, I fitted into a load at, the, at different times in my life. Um, so how we've, been, how we've been working with communities, I've for me to actually be involved, I've liked the flexibility of it, the actual ability to tap into bits that I'm able to spend my time because I am working, I am caring, and to be able to tap in and out and, and offer my bit when when appropriate. Um it's good, it's good to people to uh for people to speak to speak to you who know other people in the community i think that's really important i don't think it's necessary always approaching the groups in the community because even i find in my work sometimes you need somebody to introduce you to those groups because even professionals can have some hesitancies about engaging with somebody that isn't in their remit or in their it, it, uh, encompass and whether it's worth their time most people's i work a lot with the voluntary sector and time is very very short so actually having those meaningful contacts and somebody who can speak on your behalf and say actually this is worth listening to I think that's really important that you should take on board and and I tend to connect people up and Claire will tell you I, you know work it I did a lot of work in Fenland at the time on vaccinations so that's how um I've sort of linked people in I think it's two different worlds uh being a researcher or even going to university and then speaking to people and I've only ever seen the arc out once it as engagement so I think 
sometimes going to these events is the way to do it because actually if people don't know why people are doing research and I think that's come up with with both the Gypsy Roma Traveller and others that have mentioned it I think actually people have to understand why it's being done and I think you know if you reflect on that and actually the approach that you take I think financial uh, you know money to or vouchers to people who have taken part is also very important is that okay Brian? <laughs> is that enough Oh, wonderful. Thanks, Debbie. No, that's that's brilliant. And we'll be able to tune in um, to the panel discussion afterwards as well. So thank you, Debbie. Um, so Debbie's reflections are incredibly important and really helpful and really do reflect some of the other comments that came out through the uh, review that we undertook, but also some of the other things that came up from our review of um, one of these approaches that we've been doing to working with communities is how this sort of longer period of time of the art gives this structure within which these longer term relationships can be developed. And that's something that's really helpful because it does take time and effort to do that. Um, but also we heard about how it was important and very helpful when uh, projects and these relationships were able to develop naturally because they aligned with local and national priorities, which encouraged investment of uh, effort, resource and commitment and time. And as Debbie has touched on and what came through in our interviews as well it does it and you most of you will know it takes a lot of investment of time and effort to develop and sustain good working relationships um, and so often people are going above and beyond their usual role and duties to commit in various ways to these things. We also heard from our researchers that the approach itself sometimes didn't necessarily feel like it it managed to fit with what the university research agendas often are, which quite often um, emphasize the importance for national and international impact of findings. So then finally, some of the reflections that came from our interviews about this approach and how we could improve um, included addressing inaccessible things like this terminology that we've been using within the arc of populations in focus. We know this means nothing to anyone beyond our, our organization. But also there's more that we can do to share the learning that's gained from the work that happens within these areas. And today is a really, really great example of that. There's more that we can do about being explicit about how the work that we're doing within the art is addressing health inequalities and inequalities. And as an organization, there's more that we can do to help connect and support the connection of communities to research in a meaningful way as well. So just to wrap up, overall, this review has really highlighted the value of a relationships driven approach, including, you know, Claire meeting up with Debbie and building that relationship and getting her involved. Um, but we also understand more about the impact that these opportunities can uh, create. We know as well that there is a need for researcher training and support to undertake such an approach effectively. And um, we do know that it takes a lot of time and resource from all involved to develop sustainable working relationships, but we can really see the benefit of investment when we do. And we've already heard so many fantastic examples of that that have come up in some of these presentations today. So I just wanted to say thank you to Debbie for sharing your experiences with us today. And thank you all to listening. I'll hand back to Elspeth and I think over to our panel now. Thank you so much. That's so, so much in that session that we could have gone on from the time has been so squeezed. But if I would like to invite everybody to come back on and um, Fiona is now going to um, just chair the, this, this session for a few questions. But unfortunately, we haven't got that much time, but please keep putting them in the chat. So if you, over to you, Fiona. Yeah, th thanks so much, Elspeth. And, and very big thanks to me from everybody who's contributed um, incredible richness of uh, reminders of where the people are in re in in research and um and can i encourage everybody to have a look at the chat to see the questions and which i think um raise some quite uh, searching questions about um resources uh, the relative re reward the relative effort that people put into to research and for us to be really mindful of who who is getting what out for putting what in and i think we've heard some really uh you know powerful testimony from um 
our, our contributors today. And um, in fact, I think um, looking looking at some of the questions raised, I think people really do want to hear about uh, uh, the ethics of participation, Ewan. We're, we're very short of time, so if people could be quite brief in um, how, how they address these. But, uh, you know, do, do open a window here for us, Ewan. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I mean, I'll be brief, yeah. So the idea of the ethics of participation really comes from the work of Nancy Fraser. So she talks about the idea that, well, we know for a fact that men tend to interrupt women more than women interrupt men. We know that men tend to speak more than women. We men take more turns and longer turns. Women's interventions are often ignored. These sorts. So in terms of looking at participation, solutions to those sorts of differences tend to be about trying to create the conditions where we make everybody equal. But we are thinking through the, the consequence of that and thinking that an ethics of participation might actually be where we acknowledge the differences uh, and we work with those differences rather than trying to give everybody the same status and say we're all equal now. That's never going to be the case. You're never going to address the systematic you know, inequality and marginalisation that different groups in the community have. So rather than pretending that by all sitting around a, a round table, we can get rid of those status differentials, we actually need to acknowledge the differences and work with them if we really want to try and be more ethically particip participatory in terms of what we're doing and how we're doing it. And that's something that we're trying to do within the project. So we've got much more on that, but that's a brief synopsis of what we mean by an ethics of participation. Th th thanks very much, Ewan. And um, there there's a thread going through the um, uh, the questions as well, which is very much about how do we reach out, you know, how do we um, take some of the effort out of um, uh, supporting people to um, really take part in research? And again, I think we heard some sharp lessons from some of the contributors about what you know what what put people off what motivates them and and i just thought um maybe a quick question to um uh, sally about um relation to what kinds of if you like training and support um community pe pe uh, members might need in order to, to feel uh, enabled to take part well they don't need much training on how to speak with people, <laughs> but in terms of doing the research, we had um, and doing the peer-to-peer -peer interviews, we had a training session, see what people already knew, opportunities to ask questions and to discuss various aspects. Um, yeah, I, I, can I just respond to another question as well about doing the same research again and again and not, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, because we've um, we've worked quite hard on having a, a strong network and keeping everybody informed. So we are in touch with other people doing research. We're in touch with the communities. They're driving the questions. Um, same with health workers as well. We didn't talk about health workers, but they're also. So that, that's how we're trying to make sure that we're not doing too much overlapping and that we're focusing on what, what's important. And people feel they are, they've been listened to the first time rather than being asked the same questions a second and a third time. I think that's that's come out very uh, uh, yeah very clearly as well. Um, so the idea that uh, you know researchers and communities talk to each other to find out what's being found out. Um, has anybody from the from the um, you know, presenters got anything to um, um, add to this about uh, uh, you know building relationships with the community? I'd like to add, I'd like to add something to that. Sorry, I was on mute. I agree with that completely. Um, the way that we were able to, in the beginning, have sessions with the other community members from community-led organisations, which is a fundamental point. Um, there's a lot of organisations in the Gypsy Roma Traveller community and other communities that put people in there that don't have lived life experience. And I think that's important. They knew how to formulate the questions. We looked at the research that was already out there. There was no point in just keep repeating the same things. And we made sure that we generated that trust. But also something else that we did that I think was unique because we had it transcribed by a community member as well. So when I know from my experience of working with different universities that when you have transcriptions for this community done by um, a normal transcription company, they don't pick up the essence of what's behind the language because they haven't got a tuned ear to it. 
and you couldn't tune anyone to it. But if you had an interpreter for a different language, you would. So I think it was fundamental within this that that even though you're transcribing what they're saying, the context of what they're saying is there. And I think that that was important as well. And, and this really is about recognising, you know, what it's like here for particular people, not just kind of bringing in, uh, you know, gross assumptions or, or kind of gross... Uh, uh, stereotypes and and I, I again I think that message came through loud and clear now I'm really sorry but we're going to have to wrap up at this particular point with a with a with a load of of uh, really stimulating um, insights rattling around our heads thank you so much to everybody who's who's uh, um, brought all of their um, experience in, into this session for us all to uh, uh, thank you so much and um, thank you um, everybody who's joined in I think we're now waiting for Christine, aren't we now? I think is coming on next. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Elspeth. And thanks very much, Fiona, and for those uh, really interesting and uh, compelling um, presentations. So thank you for that. So in, in our section here, we're going to be talking about increasing skills for undertaking research in the region. And... Um, Particularly, we're going to be talking about the ARC Fellowship, and I'm joined today by two of our previous Clark Fellows, um, Alison um, Bentley and Deborah Shepherd. And before I introduce them, I'd just like to say something about our ARC Fellowship, um, because um, we'll be starting recruiting again for the next year's cohort um, in October this year. So just to give you some background, um, from those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, our programme has been running since 2010 and um, since then we've had 113 fellows go through the programme. Um, the programme itself has undergone many changes. Uh, it started off as a research fellowship um, with um, three components doing a research project, a teaching programme and action learning sets. And it was always aimed at clinicians and health and social care practitioners who wanted to do research, a research project, and to learn about research, but who didn't necessarily want um, an academic career. Um, some of our fellows have gone on to academic careers, which is fantastic, but we, um, we have sent a lot of clinician researchers back into the coal face at the NHS, and, and that um, we're very proud of the fact that, that, that we've done that. Um, so, as I said, the original fellowship um, was a research fellowship, and then we introduced an implementation fellowship in 2019. The reason we did that was because with the new ARC, implementation has become very important. Um, and so we started an implementation fellowship, and that part, um, we still have implementation fellows, um, but it's also been um, combined into a, a specific fellowship. So I just wanted to tell you about that. So our, our model has been used to, to build other fellowships on top of it. So we have the script fellows who were social care uh, research fellows. We have those uh, the four fellows for two years. And we've also had mental health fellowships. And I mentioned this specifically um, because um, one of our um, speakers today, Deborah, is a mental health fellowship uh, fellow. And that's an 18 month program, which started with 12 months of research and then followed by six months of implementation. Um, both these um, were time limited. So we won't be offering these fellowships again at the moment, um, but we are offering research and implementation fellowships next year. What's been really nice about this with adding different people from different skills and backgrounds has been that all the fellows have been learning together, have been doing the teaching program together, have been in the action learning set together. 
And that's really says a lot about the richness of the program is that you're able to work with a cohort and learn from them um, their very, very different backgrounds. Um, and so that's just something about about our fellowship that I just wanted to give you the background to our speakers. So our first speaker today is Deborah Shepherd. As I said, Deborah uh, is doing one of the um, mental health fellows uh, fellowships. And so last year she did her. Uh, she'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I think she finished in March doing her research project, and now she's currently doing the implementation part of it with Sarah Robinson, who is at the Eastern Academic Health Science Network. And so, um, Deborah, I'm going to hand over to you uh, to talk to us about how the um, programme has shaped your career. Oh, sorry, about your experience of the NIHR East of England Fellowship. Thanks, Christine. And yes, you're absolutely um, right about um, my the, the fellowship that I've been on. So um, I'm not sure if I can move the slides on, guys. Um, it's not giving me any uh, ability to do that. Oh, it's down there. That's great. Thank you. So um, my name is Deborah Shepherd. I'm the Programme Manager for Children Looked After and Care Leavers Mental Health and Wellbeing in Hertfordshire County Council. Um, as um, Christine said, I've done the ARC Mental Health Fellowship um, and I'm not going to be talking to you about my research project. I'm going to be talking to you about my experience of actually doing the fellowship programme, which um, hopefully will be interesting for people that are thinking about uh, doing something similar. Um, so Thank you. Um, probably in about late 2021, uh, an email popped up in my inbox. Um, it came from my local university via a, a colleague that worked in social care that was linked into the university. And it was about uh, promoting the application process for the, for the research fellowships. At the time, um, I was starting a major project, uh, which is a, around uh, developing more consistent practice in relation to trauma within uh, children's social care. And I wanted to evaluate that piece of work really well, because obviously it's important um, to know that public funding is being utilized effectively. So the communications that I received, the emails, it was very inclusive of social care professionals. And I was very fortunate in that the role that I'm in um, allows me a certain degree of headspace and um, opportunities for personal development. And I really enjoy working collaboratively and I really enjoy sharing ideas. So this sounded really interesting to me. Um, I wasn't seeking a career in research. Um, I wasn't um, seeking to be uh, moving towards academia. I really just saw this as an opportunity to do my job more effectively, more better. So um, the application process opened um, early in 2022 for myself. The process was very straightforward. Um, I had to provide a reference and uh, confirm support from my employer um, and just give a, a complete, a very short application um, describing my interest in improving the quality of services and my interest in leading change. Uh, what relevant experience I had in an outline of my project. And that was followed by a, a short panel interview, um, including a, a, a five minute verbal presentation on my research proposal. So that's what I had to do. Um, I started my induction in April. Um, and as you've heard, we had monthly workshops and action learning sets with, uh, I, in my code, 12 other fellows from different NIHR schemes. The sessions were delivered by a broad range of very experienced research and industry experts. And the workshops covered things like implementation science, project management, um, stakeholder engagement, uh, behavior change, and, and lot, lots of different things like that. Sorry, that was the, that's the implementation bit. The, uh, the first few uh, research workshop for the year covered things like research methods and design, ethics, very big one uh, to learn about, critical evaluation, um, system approaches uh, to, to work and boundary spanning. So really interesting topics, some of which I'd not encountered before. Um, so as I said, we had access to action learning sets, uh, which was an opportunity for reflection in small groups. That's a more intimate space to really get to know um, your colleagues, a more um, uh, 
relaxed place. And I think a lot of the really good, valuable learning takes place in those really safe spaces. Um, so uh, one year later, all the fellows deliver a poster presentation at an open event attended by their colleagues, their supervisors, um, prospective and previous fellows and others from the research community. It's a really nice um, welcoming event. And that was an opportunity for us to show the outcomes of the projects that we'd undertaken to demonstrate the learning that we'd, we'd um, unearthed, um, share our methodologies and approaches and, and our findings. My fellowship, um, as mentioned, also includes a further period to support implementation, which also consists of monthly workshops and regular one-to-one -one support time. It's very practical in nature, um, which really helps me with my uh, day job. I get one day a week salary backfill, which makes it really easy for me to protect my time to focus on the research project and, and the programme. And on to the next slide. So the programme leads provide all of the fellows with a supervisor for the duration of the programme. Mine was a professor, professor from Cambridge, which really elevated my imposter syndrome. But I was really welcomed into a family of researchers. Um, we met regularly for virtual coffee, um, catch ups. We, I was invited to uh, reading sessions to explore um, in, in papers, uh, contemporary and pre old papers. Um, where we would discuss that, uh, attended formal update meetings, as well as, um, you know, co-writing sessions. So I really felt part of a network of support and encouragement and also really benefited, benefited from being exposed to a number of really interesting studies and people. And my supervisor also facilitated a platform for me to uh, co-lead a colloquium um, with a broad research and practice community to consider a challenge that I was experiencing in my practice. And that was completely outside of my project, but one of the, well, just an example of, of how being part of this fantastic community helped me in my work. Um, I'm also, I've also been asked by, um, you know, more seasoned researchers about practice-based issues so that they could develop their own ideas and proposals and just found that to be a really um, mutually supportive and sort of organic uh, peer supported kind of space. I just found people being new to the research community were very generous with their time and their knowledge and also with their contacts. So, you know, really keen to link people up on different ideas. Um, so just coming on to um, my last slide, really, I feel like a lot has changed for me um, and the fellowship has succeeded in its aim of embedding research approaches within health and social care settings and practice. I feel much more confident to participate in policy and practice conversations within my own local system, but as well as when I attend national events. I think I'm being much more of an ambassador for evidence informed practice. I'm you know, always referring to it uh, when I deliver, um, you know, uh, conferences, for example. And everything that I've learned, I'll continue to apply in my role in the local authority, which will strengthen our approach to evaluation and make sure we're using the evidence that's available to us in a really effective way. So in that respect, I think the fellowship is having a direct and sustainable impact on practice in my area, not just my own, but all, all of my colleagues as well. And one of the other things that we've set about doing locally is establishing a reading group uh, with clinicians and, and other workers to respond to findings in, in research um, um, about children in care and those experiencing adversity, which wasn't really something that was set up before. So that's that's another uh, small thing just to mention as an outcome for, for what I've been doing. So I'll, I'll leave it there because I know we're, we're short of time, but um, yeah, happy to take any questions when we come to that time. Thank you. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a trouble with the mute button here, but I think I'm unmuted now. Thank you very much, Deborah, for that uh, for that presentation. And yes, we'll come back to that. You made some really important points um, that I'd like to pick up, but particularly the reading group, which I think is a fantastic idea. Um, but first, I'm going to call upon um, Alison. So Alison was in. Uh, so Alison was a, was a fellow um, 
cohort six. So that was a while ago because we're we're on cohort twelve now. And um, if I remember correctly, Alison, and she'll correct me if I'm wrong. Um, when she did the fellowship, she was a research nurse, and uh, she did her fellowship in the Clark east of England in the dementia frailty and end of life care theme um, with the supervisor of Professor John O'Brien and now Alison is a research associate at the University of Cambridge and works in the uh, palliative end of life care theme in the ARC so I really look forward to learning how the fellowship has uh, shaped your career Alison so please go ahead thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Alison Bentley and I'm going to talk a bit about how the ARC um, shaped my career. I don't think I can move my slides either, actually. Thank you. Yes. Um, so just a bit of context, really. I'm a community nurse by background and have worked in a variety of roles, such as district nursing, palliative care. And more recently, I've been a Parkinson's nurse where I've gone back into practice to um, implement some of the findings from my, my PhD, which I've recently finished. So over the years, I have difficulty finding opportunities for those who wish to lead and develop nursing research from an academic point of view. So initially in 2014, I moved to a clinical research nurse role based in the team at Windsor Research Unit in Fulbourne in Cambridge. Although a relatively small building, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, the staff here support many different national and local clinical trials and projects within dementia, mental health and the community. So I was lucky enough to work on a large NIHR funded project named Diamond Louie with Professor John O'Brien and his team. And we were looking at how to improve the diagnosis and management of Louie body dementia. And this is really the start of my clinical and academic um, interest in Louie body dementia from a nursing perspective. OK. Thank you. So another bit of context, really. Lewy body dementia is one form of dementia, the most common being Alzheimer's, and it's characterised by small clumps of protein that develop inside nerve cells called Lewy bodies. And Lewy body dementia is an umbrella term for two subtypes. They're called dementia of Lewy bodies and Parkinson's dementia. And they share many clinical and neuropathological similarities. However, the difference for diagnostic purpose is related to the timing of the major symptoms and the major symptoms being memory problems and motor symptoms. So motor symptoms are what we think of when we think of Parkinson's, like stiffness and slow, slowness of movement and tremor. If cognitive symptoms develop initially at the same time as the motor symptoms, it's considered to be dementia with Lewy bodies. And if our people have had Parkinson's for some time, say at least a year, um, and often, you know, they've had Parkinson's for many years, then it's referred to as Parkinson's dementia. So this means it's actually quite difficult to diagnose because people experience symptoms at, at varying times and they can be presented as, as different um, conditions. Because as well as the Parkinson's symptoms, people may experience rapid eye movement, sleep disorder, visual hallucinations, memory and mood fluctuations and falls. So the condition is clinically diagnosed as Louis bodies can only be seen on post-mortem under a microscope. And you can see in the corner, there's, there's a small pink circle and that's the, the Louis body. Whilst working as a community nurse, I was struck by the amount and severity of the complex symptoms and hospital admissions people were experiencing. Okay, next slide. So as the Diamond Louis pro project progressed, I noticed that many of the people had a high level of physical symptoms compared to other dementias. This is because Louis body disease can have a significant impact on a person's involuntary nervous system. And this is a system that automatically regulates many bodily functions, including bladder and bowels, temperature regulation and changes in blood pressure. And when these systems go awry, this can cause all kinds of problems, including dizziness, falls and difficulty swallowing. And this research linked back to my clinical experiences. So the questions that formed in my mind were, how is this problem affecting people living with a condition and their families? What are their experiences and how do they cope? So I talked to colleagues and looked at the current research and found there was a gap in the area. I thought these were important questions and I wanted to find some answers. 
My ultimate aim was to find ways that management of these symptoms might be improved and raise awareness of the fact that these changes may be related to the Lewy body condition and not just as old or age as what people often put them down to. Okay. Next slide. So, oh yeah, that's the one. No, the one one before. Sorry. Yeah, that's the one. So. I didn't quite know how to take this research idea that was forming forward, but my manager suggested I apply for a Clark Fellowship, which was the older version of the ARC Fellowship, as Christine said. I was successful in 2016, and what that one year's fellowship offered my career was a variety of core skills, similar to what Deborah talked about. These include monthly meetings of practical training in research methods and refining and developing the research aim and questions, support in the form of ARC supervisors and access to people with research experience in a variety of fields, confidence in the form of coaching and support from peers in the group, and protect a time to complete my research project by an experiential learning approach. So during the year I worked on the project, I initially approached the CPFT user and care involvement service, and we brought together a group of fam four family members who helped work developing the design, study, leaflets, posters, and interview guide for the research. They also helped pilot the interview questions and advise on recruitment. Chris, one of the group, was familiar with Join Dementia Research, the national database where people living with dementia and their carers can sign up to take part in studies. So later on in the project, two members were also involved in reviewing some of the early interviews. They looked at it from a family member perspective, sometimes seeing ideas and themes that I as a healthcare professional hadn't noticed. And later when all the interviews were completed, they were involved in discussions about some of the key symptoms and broader themes that emerged. So in the end of the project, after a year, I'd interview 10 people with Lewy body and 12 family members. And with everyone's help, we managed to get to the stage of preliminary analysis within the year. So the ARC Fellowship shaped my career by giving me core skills and experience. And it also shaped my career by opening doors. Initially, this was by, by being awarded an Alzheimer's Society Research Dissemination Grant, which was a joint application with Chris. Chris felt that it was particularly important that the findings from the ARC study were shared. So we developed posters and leaflets raising awareness, went to conferences and did talks for various groups with grant money. And this experience of applying for grants led on to others, such as the British Geriatric Society and Alzheimer's UK Travel Grant, so we could take the poster further. So this is Chris and I here. And when we were at one of the conference, we were approached by a representative from the Nursing Older People Journal. They wanted to do a follow up piece about small research studies that can inform practice and the importance of working together as clinicians, researchers and people with a, living with a condition. So whilst listening to people with Lewy body dementia and families in the interviews for the ARC project, they often talked about what their future might look like, how long they had to live and what they may die of. And being interested in palliative care, I decided to investigate further. So the research appeared to show that people with Lewy body dementia may have shorter life expectancy than other dementias. And this made me think, what are the experience of people living and dying with Lewy body dementia? Are they different from other forms of dementia? And what might be their palliative care needs be? So having the grounding from the ARC Fellowship gave me a platform to apply for scholarships and grants to complete a part-time PhD with the Lancaster University. The PhD explored experiences of living and dying with Lewy body dementia using longitudinal narrative interviews. So I did three interviews over six months with couples. I also use life story work as a way to enhance communication for those with more advanced dementia. And a new group with lived experience were heavily involved again from the outset. And they said to me, focus more on living as most people with Lewy body don't see this as a life limiting condition. And generally I think of palliative care in relation to hospices and cancer. So their very early input in the design helped shape the whole PhD right from the beginning. And this PhD was part funded by Florence Nightingale Research um, Fellowship, 
Cambridge and Peterborough NHS Strategic Research Grant. And the final two years were um, funded by the Louis Body Society. So I was very lucky to be able to get money to, to follow on from the, the ARC Fellowship. So having completed the PhD, I've recently taken up a position as a research associate working in the public health and primary care department, finally being able to focus on palliative care research in the community. This post is funded by ARC East of England with the aim to work on local projects and seek funding for future research. So to summarize, the ARC Fellowship enabled me to develop research skills and confidence, opened doors for further funding, and started a process that allowed me to enter an academic research career, which can be particularly challenging within the community nurse profession. Thank you. Thank you, finally. Thanks very much, Alison, and, uh, and to Deborah. So we've heard two very inspiring stories about what the Clark and Arc Fellowship has done in, in helping um, to very hardworking NHS um, health and social care workers to develop their career. And I think both of your stories are really very inspiring. And congratulations on your PhD, Alison. That's a really fantastic achievement. So what I wanted to ask, really, I mean, I think the fellowship as it is, is, is a really opportunity for people who want to go that way. But I think you'll probably agree that many of your colleagues probably don't have the time or the inclination to do a fellowship. And I was just wondering how how can we increase research awareness in your colleagues? Because one of the things about the fellowship is that we've we're sending out skilled people back into the NHS who understand research and can sort of spread that uh, research friendly. Um, environment um, to colleagues. So I was going to ask you that question. And then, Deborah, you mentioned your reading group, which I think is a really good idea. Does that involve all your staff then? And do you talk about new research and new evidence in your particular areas? Yeah, so if I, I'll respond to that and then perhaps come on to your, your first question, um, Christine, and, 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 and see what Alison thinks as well. Um, so there's been through closer connection with the research community um, colleagues have been passing to me new research that's really interesting and perhaps asks us to think about you know the culture in our mental health services and biases towards uh, children that are care experienced so um, I went to my local mental health trust um, I know particular individuals there that are also uh, studying and involved in research and we had an initial meeting about how how might we um, how might I in social care feel assured that the mental health trust is reading these and responding to these and taking them through practice governance routes to make any changes that are needed? Um, and we came up with the idea that although there are, you know, uh, small team meetings where people are looking at research and reading, um, uh, you know, that's all very isolated. It doesn't involve us working um, as a system around this, uh, you know, to meet the holistic needs of this complex cohort of children and young people so we really needed something that was a, a little bit more joined up so we we had a bit of a think about how we might do that and we put together a proposal to go to the leadership within our local mental health trust that details a possible structure for those um has some thoughts about who might um, attend some of those sessions how we might decide which papers would go to this group for example um, and, and some other, and, and what the governance might be and what outcomes we would like to see from that. So we've just started working together to develop a proposal to take to the leadership to um, get that agreed. But I think even if we didn't, um, you know, have that kind of formal structure, I think informally uh, colleagues are really interested in making a bit of time to just think through some of those things together. Um, and then in relation to your first question, I mean, I heard about the fellowship through my local university and my local university are great at, you know, um, you know, really reaching into our, our social care teams. Um, but I think also there are, 
you know, organisations like, you know, what works in children's social care that, you know, seem to have the ear, um, you know, the ACDCS um, groups that are there to support children's services directors certainly have the ear of social care teams and um, maybe some communications through those routes might be helpful. Okay, thank you, Deborah. And Alison, what, what do you think about how we can sort of increase research knowledge amongst your colleagues who perhaps don't have the time to do fellowships? Yeah, I think the yeah, the importance is trying to get them to some conferences because um, for nurses, it's one of those things that goes on the back burner. I've recently been to a um, the difficulties of getting research into practice with Parkinson's nurses. So if they haven't got time to to get onto a Clark Fellowship, it's just giving them that one day space for their learning. If the, if the managers will allow that, I think that then generates a stimulation to start with. And they you know they might see a nurse um, do a talk there. Um, and I think journal clubs and um, training sessions, because especially within um, some of the areas I've worked, um, dementia and Parkinson's, there's a lot of, of, of skills needed. And we've all got different skills within the team. So even if it's 40 minutes at lunchtime, um, a monthly session, I think that in increases the research awareness and the relevance, because often with nurses, they do um, see um, that as a research as a separate part of the job sometimes so I think embedding it that way would def definitely helps. Yeah thank you. Um, I've got a question here from Lysha who wants to ask Deborah has your fellowship experience inspired your colleagues to also explore doing fellowships and do they come to you for advice? So I don't know if I've quite got the balance between sort of inspiring people and going on about things far more than I should. But um, yes, I'd like to think so. So when we do joint pieces of work together, you know, we always pause and, you know, just, you know, have we checked the evidence base? Um, you know, have we just done a quick check to see if there's any new research in the way that we've been doing things forever? Um, so I think there is that sort of constant reminder. And I think that does then uh, drip feed into people working in a slightly different way. Um, I don't know if it's actually inspired anybody to um, undertake research, but particularly, you know, maybe additional study. I think, you know, when, when people see um, people releasing themselves from the day job, it does start to make them think, well, perhaps I could do some research or perhaps I could do some further study. So I think it's been helpful in that respect. Good, thank you. And again from Lysha, this time for Alison which is not directly related to your fellowship experience, but which organisations or teams did you find the most supportive in identifying people with Lewy body dementia that might be interested in being involved? Yeah, the main ones in Cambridge and sort of CPFT where I've been working are the Parkinson's team, because obviously they follow up people um, for many years and if they go on to develop dementia, uh, Parkinson's dementia and the um, memory services and crisis team actually in, in CPFT, because a lot of these people, as you can see from the symptoms there, do come into the, you know, into crisis really um, with the symptoms. So yeah, those three areas, certainly in Cambridge anyway, is where I found um, people were being identified. Good. And I think my last question is, if the Clark and ARC Fellowship hadn't come along, would you have found another way to follow your dream of doing research? Um, what, what other routes do you think would have been open to you? I, I think I'd already done a master's and I think master's degrees where they've, um, you know, where they do a bit of research is, is, a, is another way I may have done it. But a lot of master's degrees say they haven't got time to do a research project. So you may just do, um, um, we may do a systematic route, it's very valuable, but you still don't get those research skills. So I think I would have somehow, you know, tried to get a, a master's that would have been a bit more research focused, but I was struggling for a long time to gain access. So, yeah, I found it difficult to find anything else. Right. Uh, and Deborah? Um I think I would have, I think I probably, because I'm much more interested in sort of evaluating the work that we do, I think I would have just muddled through and I think that would have had a really significant impact on 
you know, whether pieces of work are maintained, um, receive, you know, ongoing funding or expanded. So I don't, I don't think I was certainly uh, um, not really awake to a, a whole bunch of different opportunities. And, of, and as you know, um, external evaluations can be very expensive for, for public bodies. So this is a really cost effective uh, way of supporting my organisation to, to know for sure how we're spending our money is having an impact. Well, we're very pleased that we were able to help you along in your research career. It's been really fantastic to hear your stories today. And so just to finish, because our time has run out now, um, I just want to reiterate that um, that our um, next cohort starts in March 24 until uh, March 25, end of March 25, and um, applications open on the 16th of October. So we're going to be advertising it, putting it in the newsletter, but do pass pass that along to anybody you think who might be interested. And it's all about, for us, um, if the fellowship is about getting a, a research friendly culture within the NHS. It's about inspiring research and uh, with pe so that people within the NHS understand the value of research and best practice and aren't scared of it and don't get imposter syndrome. And, and so it becomes kind of a familiar thing and a, not a scary thing, but it's something that everybody needs to do. So thank you very much, Alison Bentley. It's really, Alison and, and Deborah, it's been really inspiring listening to you. And thank you for coming back and telling us about your experiences. Thanks very much. So, um, We've run out of time and I'm going to pass over now, I think it's to Catherine, who's going to um, uh, start the session on the journey of our research. Catherine, are you there? I am. Good. Thank you, Christine. Hello, well, welcome. Um, and thank you, thank you, Christine, and thank you for that, that session. So I'm Catherine Almack, I'm Professor of Family Lives and Care at the University of Hertfordshire and I'm also theme lead, as it says on the slide, for the ageing and multi-mobility theme, which aims to improve how older people and others living with multi-mobility are supported by health and social care and their local communities to be able to live well. So thank you everybody for, for staying on. I've lost sight of how many we've got in the audience, but still a significant audience who've, who've stayed with us for this sixth and final session of the day, which is a very rainy day in Nottingham. I don't know what it's like with everybody else. So this session is called The Journey of Our Research. And we're going to hear from two projects that have built upon work from the former Clark so that's the collaboration that was in place before the ARC East of England launched in 2019. And these, uh, these projects have continued to grow as part of the Applied Research Collaboration. And we hope you'll find this an inspiring way to finish the, uh, the day and the showcase as these projects highlight the longevity of research. And this is topical, particularly thinking about our current forward thinking phase of the ARC East of England. So both presenters we're going to hear from today have worked on Clark projects in the past. Um, and we're first going to hear from Claire Goodman and then Chiara, um, you might have to correct me on the presentation of your name, Lombardo. So first of all, I'd like to welcome Claire Goodman, who is going to talk to us about the Daxia study. And this is a large NIHR funded study that's been led by the Archives of England. It began in the Clark with the creation of a national Clark uh, care home network whose members refined the questions and agreed the design. So Claire, I'm hoping you're gonna pop up now and over to you. Okay, hello. Um, so thank you very much for that introduction. And oh, I'm not on video. There we go. I should come up. Thanks. Right. So I think this has probably been a day of acronyms. Um, but I just would like to emphasize that this presentation is really talking about how collaboration has built a program of work, the C in Clark and in ARC. 
So what I'm going to talk about is the focus of the Datcha study, which was care homes and how we got to the Datcha study. It's a funded for 2.4 million over four years. Um, the setup of the network that Catherine um, referenced and also the very clear message that we're better together, not only across the east of England, but also nationally with other ARCs. A bit of detail about the Datcha and then how that is having impact. So care homes, I think we need to look at that a little bit to understand. They are completely separate from the NHS. They're in social care, but they're a key partner. They provide all our long-term care for older people in this country, and they have almost three times as many beds as hospital beds, so a very significant source of provision. But when you look at them, we've got about 11,000 care homes that cater for those who are over 65 with 5,000 different providers. So an incredibly eclectic marketplace from people who have one or two care homes to the very large for profit chains, which if you're a researcher and you're trying to do work that can be applied, you need to really think about um, how you connect with all these different providers. And as the pandemic showed, there really isn't a centralized system of control or voice for this sector. It's not like the NHS. And from a societal point of view, they are undervalued, under-resourced and frequently misunderstood. So from Clark to Arc, we developed, as Catherine mentioned, an interest in care homes, just partly uh, serendipity. There were researchers working in care homes and they were brought together through these workshops, um, uh, which were jointly held with the Academic Health Science Network. And there were also in the earlier iterations some funded studies that focused on care homes, a review looking at hydration and also a study looking at emergency ambulance use for people with dementia in different settings. So out of this work developed a recognition of the need for a national network to link up all these solitary researchers working across the country. And the Clark was a very good way of doing it. So we connected researchers, clinicians, care home providers and dementia charities, because it's worth remembering about 70 percent of people in care homes have cognitive loss. And really, the goal was to reduce the duplication because care home research questions tend to come up again and again around certain issues like end of life care, use of emergency and urgent services and so on. So over this time from Clark to Arc, we have three produced three summary reports that summarizes all the work across the country. We've had three face-to-face -face London meetings, which have really been a focus on working and sharing to, to maximise and optimise how we can work together, and also um, capacity building, so involving researchers at doctoral and postdoctoral level in care homes. And a lot of that has been around dementia. Two of our doctoral funded uh, PhD researchers worked in care homes and research priority setting, which then feeds into briefings. And one of the outputs from one of our meetings was to write a briefing for NIHR about what future research should be addressing for care homes. And so this collaboration led to a range of things. Um, so I've already mentioned about less duplication, but it also brought people from different disciplines to exposure to very different methods of working in and with care homes. Um, it also was there for a pandemic response. We developed these top tips for tricky times. We pooled researchers who were working in key areas uh, to provide these rules of thumb for care home managers who suddenly had to um, work out how they were going to communicate with family, how they were going to provide reassurance when they couldn't touch residents, or how they were going to help people with dementia not move around the care home. And these top tips were all evidence-based top tips. They weren't guidance, they were just distilling the evidence to say, right, this might help. And they were incredibly well received and were a direct response to care home managers saying that they needed help. Grant capture, I'm going to talk about Datcha shortly, and I've talked a little bit about capacity building, but it brings people in who are wanting to explore different ways of working. 
And if you look at some of these examples as well, there's the Niche Leeds, which is led by Karen Spilsbury at Yorkshire and Humber Arc, which is a living lab where they have researchers in care homes presenting and sharing their work. The Exchange System, which is what Penarc in the West, in the country, West England have done to engage with care homes to develop and apply research evidence. We've also generated large grants like Datcher, but also small ones, commissioned work around online consultations between professionals and care home staff. And finally, the study that is underway now, which is taking forward some of the work from Datcher to look at how activity providers can facilitate public involvement with people who are living in care homes. So the Datcher study, Datcher study is a four and a half year study it's in its last year now. Those five houses represent five programs of work. The first were reviews of evidence and looking at how to build capacity in care home research. The second is about building a trial repository so that we can maximize the use of research data for secondary data analysis. The third one is learning about how do you use standardized data to improve the care of people living in care homes and involve particularly care home staff in making it more than an administrative exercise. And then work packages four and five, which are developing a prototype minimum data set that aims to link data held in routine data sets about care home residents with data that care homes generate. And we are working with two software providers to make those kind of um, links to minimize the burden of data capture on care homes and also mean that residents are recognized in all systems of data capture. And if you look at the bottom of this slide, you'll see it's a bit like a Formula One logo fest. But really, I think that catalyzes what we achieved through the care home network. There are six arcs represented with these universities who are all partners. And we wouldn't have found each other um, without that collaboration and network. And some of us had no prior experience of working together until then. So in a way, we capitalized on the resource and expertise. So to give you a flavor of some of the deliverables, We've produced guidance on resident assessment and outcome measurement that came out of work package one, and also guidance on implementation of innovation. This is work Guy Perrier led and understanding why a lot of studies can hit the buffers because they haven't really approached um, assessment of care home readiness to participate. New methods to support staff and resident engagement in research with guidance, a trial repository, which will be available for people to pursue secondary data uh, analysis. And Lisa Irvin is leading work to identify social care research questions amenable to secondary data analysis. Protodata, prototype MDS I've told you about, and then recommendations on implementation of the minimum data set for social care. And I think the point I really need to make is this proposal was funded before the pandemic. And before the pandemic, we were a niche group interested in data. It has now exploded because the pandemic exposed what we knew was that standardized data wasn't available. And we have been working very closely now with the Department of Health and Social Care and NHS England to share our findings and inform their policy implementation around shared social care record and standardized methods of data capture. So these are all the many kinds of um, outputs we've got. Please do go to the website. You can just see it there slightly to the left of the slide um, where you can see all the different resources that are designed for different audiences. We've also got a webinar which is being enabled by the ARC um, and this is looking at the implementation of minimum data sets and what we have learned. The first one was about the um, evidence reviews and there'll be a third one on the minimum data set itself. So to summarize, this enabled us, the Clark and the ARC, to address an underserved area of research, and I think that's been a recurring theme today, where we put front and center care homes, interests and needs, if you like, change the bias to it always being about the NHS. It encouraged collaboration and priority setting, we built capacity and are carrying to and grant capture. And it's an existing infrastructural support expertise and interest, which is nested within a national arc theme for ageing and dementia. So in a way, this gives you a vision of how a regional involvement can expand to a national one. 
and it really makes sure that care homes are very valued research partners. So thank you very much. And I'd just like to highlight that Crystal Warmoth will be taking over the leadership of the ARC Care Home Network. And here is her contact details. And these are all the people involved in the Datcha study and everything I've said are my views and not those of NHR or DHSC. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Is this Kiara? Yes, it's Kiara. Yeah, yes. Thank you. I'm not thank my name correctly. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. Well, thank you, Claire. Um, so now we're going to hear from Kiara, who will be talking about managing fatigue in the UK ambulance se sector and how this study has evolved also from previous Clark findings. Thank you, Kiara. Yeah. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I I'm sure you can see me. I'm not sure I can have activated the video. So it looks like everything is working. So um, it is a, I'm really pleased to be here this afternoon. And I'm aware that I am the last presenter of the day uh, after uh, a day of very interesting presentation. So I'll do my best uh, to keep the attention alive and make this presentation as interesting as possible. Um, so I'm presenting here on behalf of the CAPNAP, CAPNAPS team and Professor Chrissy Sanderson that uh, unfortunately uh, cannot be here this afternoon. And I will be talking about our journey from a Clark funded project, uh, Sleep Smart, uh, to CAPNAPS. Uh, and we are looking at um, uh, we are looking at fatigue and how to manage fatigue in the ambulance uh, sector. Um, okay, so I will start with this presentation with a little hint of my research journey. And then I will talk about why we want to investigate sleep in the ambulance sector, how we went from sleep smart to catnaps and um, our study design and what are the preventative approaches in sleep management uh, at work. Um, just a few words about me. So um, I am a public mental health researcher. I started my um, research journey, personal research journey back into Clark East of England where I was working at different projects, looking at how mental health services can be improved for the benefits of patients, um, family, friends, and of course, staff. Uh, then I moved on to a couple of years to work into the third sector with the Mental Health Foundation to focus on primary prevention uh, in, pub in public mental health. So look at inequalities and how they impact our mental health. And now I am back into the ARC and I'm working well with the University of East Anglia in the School of Health Services and specifically looking at mechanisms that can put in play, we can put in place to improve mental health and work conditions in emergency sector. So um, why uh, do we want to study the ambulance sector? and why we are so interested. Um, so there is, first of all, an increased risk of a range of poorer health outcomes. And specifically, um, the risk of suicide is much higher compared to the general workforce and to other emergency service occupations. And in terms of morale, absenteeism, uh, sickness, engagement, and um, all the other like staff experiences, um, ambulance staff perform uh, much um, worse, consistently worse than, than the others. So definitely it's an area that we want, we need to investigate and we need to make something about it. So um, Sleep Smart uh, to cut up. So Sleep Smart was a project initiated around in 2018, so before the pandemic. And uh, it's the first study in the UK looking at sleep quality and fatigue uh, in, the, um, in the ambulance staff. And we use different <coughs> clinical relevant uh, measure. <coughs> it was conducted in one study, in one trust in the east of England. 
So we collected uh, data from around uh, 689 staff and they reported um, important clinical important levels of fatigue and um, mental health uh, issues and 70% uh, reported poor sleep quality. Um, then staff fatigue were more likely to report be injured or to um, be victim of an incident, uh, for example, road incident uh, at the scene, so unsafe at the scene. And then we uh, mapped uh, the, um, the trust, the UK trust around the UK, and no one, no one, no trust in England actually has a fatigue policy, a fatigue management policy. There is only one trust in the whole UK that has a such um, policy. Uh, but um, one in third people, then we saw that one in third staff are using some sleep tracker. So, for example, smart watches to, um, to monitor their fatigue. Um, so then the next logical step then was to um, put a grant and um, try to get some funding to, uh, to develop a new study. And in fact, we received some funding from the NIHR uh, to develop now a new national study. Um, and uh, with the aim of co-produce and implement a fatigue and risk framework uh, with stakeholders, with all the stakeholders involved in managing sleep and fatigue. Um, we have a uh, focus on public mental health and uh, yeah, it's a um, co-production uh, in the essence so just um, to mention briefly uh, what we mean by public health approaches to sleep health. So I've got here some examples. So we have three broad categories when we, want, when we talk about public health um, and sleep health. So we have some predictive approaches. So where we want to think about, we think about designing and working hours. So for example, through biomathematical models, so where people use specific algorithms, uh, so for example of um, sleep history, time away, uh, to come up with an ideal model of shift scheduling, or we can do personalized rotas. So looking, for example, at the individual personal, social, psychological needs, and put together um, an effective rota. Then we have some more proactive approaches um, where uh, we want to edu educate staff, for example, in good sleep habits or good eating habits, healthy life habits. And when we encourage staff to manage uh, mental health and physical health conditions that they might already have pre-existing and that impact sleep. Then we have some more reactive uh, approaches that mitigate uh, fatigue in a workplace. Um, so for example, policies, uh, specific policies, or um, designing um, a work environment uh, where people can take naps, uh, power naps uh, during their breaks. So in a nutshell, these are like a few examples of how in public health we approach uh, sleep health. So um, I mentioned that CapNaps is focused on co-production. So we have built an alliance, a coalition of the will willing, and we have put together different stakeholders. So we have the National Ambulance Partnership, including unions, fatigue experts from the health and safety executive, uh, the Association of Ambulance Chief Executive National Groups, and we have ambulance service staff, and uh, of course we have patients, so those who have experienced um, using an ambulance, being an ambulance and using the service. And we also have people who live the experience who, for example, are member of staff, who have been involved in an incident, uh, why, for example, driving a vehicle and uh, they were too fatigued and as a result, uh, they ended up in an incident. And we all together, uh, we are aiming at co-producing, at creating a fatigue risk management uh, system. 
So what's happening then in CatNaps? How do we want to make change? How do we want to make a difference? So CatNaps is um, divided into four work packages. So we are about to start for a work package three and four. And we have started by identifying the best practice in fatigue management. So an evidence synthesis of the best practices in uh, all the emergency sectors, so fire and rescue services, aviation, transport, and ambulance. Then we are going back to our ambulance, um, to the ambulance services. And we are talking with, and I've been talking with um, senior leaders, uh, frontline staff, uh, patients, and we are going to carry out uh, comparative case study analysis and conduct ethnographic studies um, with ambulance crews. So we will actually be in the ambulance and the operation centers. So we will then collect all this information and we will integrate um, our fundings on what is currently done in the uh, ambulance sector, what is working, what is working less well, and produce an implementation guidance and, um, and then test um, the usability of the guidance in our four case studies. So um, all we want to do then is design implementation strategy uh, based on what staff and patients have told us, and we make to uh, we hope to make uh, this uh, strategy fit for purpose for the ambulance sector, and then for the different um, emergency emergency sector. So we. We closed the, the cycle that we started with the smart a sleep smart project when we identify that um, sleep and fatigue it's a issue in the ambulance sector and we want to offer an, an implementation strategy that um, will work. So if you want to get in touch, uh, thank you very much for listening. And um, so these are our contact details. So the CatNap study email address, my own email address, and then Christy um, contact details. So thank you very much um, for, for listening. Thank you, Chiara. Uh, I'm just getting, there we go. I can start my video again. Well, thank you, Claire, and uh, and thank you care of those interesting uh, presentations. Um, so um, I'm just going to look to the chat for questions. Um, a couple of questions come in. Claire, perhaps for you, and, um, and I was thinking as well in terms of, um, you know, that there's an opportunity here potentially to link in with the ARC fellowships in terms of the um, sort of repository um, of secondary data analysis that, that would be a fantastic opportunity for an ARC fellow. Um, but how, has it opened up other research opportunities? Well, obviously it has, but do you want to just quickly identify some of those? Um, yeah, so this is the nature of studies of this size and the number of collaborators that everybody has research ideas. So yes, there's the Chappie study, which Elspeth Mathy uh, is uh, involved with with Anne Killett. Um, but we've also have had a series of smaller studies um, that have come under the umbrella of DATCHA that's NIHR funded. So one has been looking at domiciliary care, because what this has exposed is if we think it's difficult to get data from care homes, we know even less about people who receive domiciliary care from the phenomenal number of providers. So there's um, been um, some exploratory work on, done on that, led um, by Barbara Hanratty and Vanessa Davey from uh, Newcastle, Northeastern Cumbria, ARC. And we've also been doing some in-depth work for the care home staff, asking them to do think aloud interviews while they're entering data information about the residents, because it's very easy for it just to be an admin exercise. And so using think aloud methodology, particularly when they're assessing quality of life and mental health, um, to really unpick what is how they're interpreting what they're being asked to complete on behalf of people thanks claire and i was also directed to through those two presentations that um 
both areas are addressing workforce issues for for mm -hmm. workforces that are under immense pressure and um and undervalued Chiara, I was very interested in in your work about um you know the, the catnap study I love that uh, acronym um catnap um how easy was it to get the workforce involved in the research given the immense pressures that that they face yeah, this has been our one of the biggest challenges we had. So in work package one and two, uh, which we have uh, just concluded, uh, we carried out interviews with senior leaders and uh, so people who work in operations, health and well-being, HR, health and safety. And we also conducted some workshops with senior leaders. And of course, even like the immense challenges of the NHS, Plus, um, we conducted our data collection coincided with the strikes. Um, so yes, um, really doing the interviews and recruiting was uh, quite a challenge and was like a matter of building up those relationships with each trust uh, because we recruited 11 of the 13 ambulance trusts around the UK. So that's quite um, a good result. Uh, but of course, it, it was like a lot of work in um, promoting our study, showing the benefits of our study and the value or the potential benefit and, and the value of the study. And I think here, um, co-production has been quite uh, key because we have so many stakeholders involved. And um, so people around the nation know that our study um, is, is happening and they want to be involved, they want to contribute. It is just a matter of finding the time and from us as a researchers have that flexibility uh, to accommodate um, the schedules of really busy stuff. Thank you. Yeah, and that theme of co-production has run throughout the day, hasn't it? Yeah. Well, I think we'll bring questions to a close there. Um, there was a, a question from Wendy about, Adam, you might want to mention a plan for a data analysis fellowship, but perhaps you could put that in the chat. And now I will hand over to, to Wendy to, to close the day. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, I don't know if Adam's still on the call, but it's something we, we've been talking about, given the need for sort of data, data linkage, data sharing. Um, and the use of routine data, we wonder whether we could have a fellowship focusing on that. And it won't be in the next cohort, it will be after that. But, you know, I think there's a lot more we can do with, with data um, more generally, um, as those last two studies have shown. So thank you, everybody that stayed on until the end. Um, even though we had the big gap in the middle, it still feels like a long day for us all to be sitting online. But again, another wonderful set of presentations. And thank you so much to everybody who input into how the day was structured today. I think the themed sort of sessions with um, panel discussions worked really well, but we'd welcome your feedback when you get sent um, a feedback form. Please do tell us what you thought about it so that we can take that, those comments on board. And thank you to our core team at the ARC for seamlessly putting this together. It seemed to be delivered very smoothly and all the technology on the whole worked really well. We can't always say that. So thank you to everybody. I think we've heard a lot this afternoon that as ever makes me really committed to making sure that we increase diversity and participation in research. Apologies if you can hear my doorbell. Um, and about the sort of ethics and equity of participation. And Bryony talked about our populations in focus review, and we will obviously circulate that as a report and other accessible outputs. But we've learned a lot in there about the challenges as well as the many benefits of why we do participation and we do connect across the region, but the sort of time, money, skills, investments in capacity building are not to be underestimated. But isn't it worth doing when we do it well? And I think we've heard so much. And thank you to our sort of community participants who told us today, you know, what it's like to not feel represented and to not know about research. That should drive us all forward to continue to do what we do as effectively as we can. And to build those community bridges, I think that came out this afternoon as well. And I loved hearing our, our two previous fellows talking about being an ambassador and the doors that open. And that's what we're about. We, we're not an organisation, we're a collaboration. Um, and that's the most important part of what we do. We do all need to connect. So all of you are part of the ARC. 
And all of you can help us, please, in making sure that what we do is visible so that we open more opportunities. We are as inclusive as we possibly can be and that we increase participation in everything we do so that we improve services and outcomes across the whole of our geography in the east of England. So please promote our annual report summary, promote our, our, our sort of other findings that we put your way. The links to all the projects are on our website. Connect with our themes get involved in the theme meetings because we need everybody to make the arc as good as it possibly can be and as effective as it can be. So I think it's time for us all to get away from our screens. So thank you once again for staying with us. Really hope you enjoyed that. I certainly did. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all again at our, our next event. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you.